We're here to talk about a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks called Truth. Truth is spelled with a lowercase t. And um, I'm really sorry we don't have a recording of Gwen Brooks reading this poem. I don't know that there that one exists, but she is such a fine reader of her poems. I won't do it any justice, but lacking the audio, I thought I would read it, and then we'll talk about it. Truth. And if sun comes, how shall we greet him? Shall we not dread him? Shall we not fear him after so lengthy a session with shade? Though we have wept for him, though we have prayed all through the night years, what if we wake one shimmering morning to hear the fierce hammering of his firm knuckles hard on the door? Shall we not shudder? Shall we not flee into the shelter, the dear, thick shelter of the familiar, propitious haze? Sweet is it, sweet is it to sleep in the coolness of snug unawareness, the dark hangs heavily over the eyes. Okay, Anna, if a if a seventh grader comes to you and says, what's this poem about? What's the simplest thing you could say about what it's about? I know we don't do a lot of about here, but what's it about? I think it's about the sun. Okay. The sun at what time of day? Early morning. Early morning. Okay. Kristen, what has happened prior to the sun coming up? Uh, everyone was sleeping in cool, snug beds, mm-hmm. and they are. Um, has been. It's been a long time of sleep, night years. Yeah. Why does she, Amaris? Why does she use night years? That's such a. What happens at that point in the poem? Up until then, you think, oh, this is about the morning, and it's not complicated. Why does night years change potentially change everything? Um, to me, that's where it took on symbolic significance. Um, she seems to be creating sort of a conventional opposition between the blissful ignorance of night, um, which is prolonged over a long period of time. It's not just about the sun coming up, but, and the sun potentially symbolizes truth or some confrontation. So you really want to go symbolic, or you recognize that symbolism is possible? I, it seemed to be a sign of symbolism. Yes. Okay. I, what I want to do is I want to go around and ask everyone very briefly to say what Night Years is or does. Just throw something out on the table. So, Dave Poplar, what what does not, you know, it's it's the morning, the sun's coming up, and We've prayed and we've wept for him, the sun, all through the night years. What's happened in those night years, and what does it make you think? Like Al Maurice, I read this uh, symbolically, and to me, night years is really about self-deception and complacency. Okay. Jason, night years? Um, well, when I read it, I heard light years, but I think it's a time of tri- uh, a time of great darkness that has seemed to go on for so long that one has become used to it. That's cool. Is there a tradition, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot, is there a tradition in, in poetry and or music where we've been through a long night and now the day comes? Do, can you, are you familiar with that tradition? Uh, I'm sure. Let's see. I mean, it comes up uh, in, in the blues. Uh, the blues, yeah. And yeah. can you just riff a little bit on, um, I'm not asking you to sing the blues or even to quote <laughs> the blues, but what's the typical sentiment of of the long night well it's a relief it's uh well the the, the long night is um you know some negative period perhaps a depression perhaps um you know some a binge uh, yes, for, right certainly a binge uh, and then the following day is well generally positive not in the, not in the case of this poem or not entirely um, but uh, the day is the thing we look forward to Max and Anna, um, have you ever had a long long night and the sun comes up and you're really not ready for it you don't have to be personal about this, but is this a, is is Brooks talking about a common feeling, Max? Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes, I mean, that's the effect of the night and the effect of sleep is that this strange, at once contraction and expansion of time, like when you're f- falling in and out of a dream and and out of sleep. This so actually, in our con- to our consciousness, night can be forever if you've been. If you've been doing a lot and stayed up late and then slept, you have no, you're very disoriented. So night years doesn't need to be symbolic. It could actually be her way of describing the night. Um, Anna, your thought on this? 
Yeah, I just think sometimes if you're like maybe you're really stressed out and it just seems like this is just like never ending and then it finally ends and you don't know what to do with yourself. Okay, Allie, your turn. We're still on night years. Um, we have wept for him and prayed. That does suggest a symbolic reading. Are you willing to go there? Yeah. Who, who or what might the sun be? Well, I mean, it's called truth. So Small T, though. But still, I, I, I can't help but think of tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Yeah. Um, and... There is something Dickinsonian about the stanza, slightly, but go ahead. Um, and, you know, even if it is the sun, it's illuminating something else. Um, and that might be too bright or too sudden or too painful. Um, okay, that's cool. You you did a really good uh, sort of literary close reading of it, but um, Kristen, I'll, I'll shift to you then. Um, if th Can there be a precise symbol that can be drawn from this poem? I don't think it's a precise symbol. I think it's it, it's a multitude of symbols, actually. Can we at least acknowledge that in the tradition of uh, Christian iconography that the sun and the son of God yeah, are Yeah, I mean, if you take the sun, S-U-N, S-O-N, pun, then it's Christ. And the sun rising. Mm -hmm. um, what else? We have the praying. Mm -hmm. Is there any other potential? The knocking on the door. Ah, uh, let's talk about the knocking on the door. I mean, for me, going back to Max's hangover. Oh, did we say there was a hangover, Max? I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> outing you. When Max has been carousing all night, binging, I think was the word that Steve and I used, and um, the, the, the morning comes, right? And, you know, it's, you know, fierce hammering. Wake up, it's daytime, Max. Come on, get it together. <laughs> Is that possible, Kristen, that it's simply... The hammering, I mean, it really is kind of frightening. Hard, knuckles, hard yeah. on the door. I mean, How could it, that be Christian? Um, like Judgment Day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a specific image of, um, uh, uh, gee whiz, I wish I had the, the source. It may be Acts of the Apostles, but there, uh, it's a metaphorical story that uh, you need to let Christ into your own heart. You are, uh, that is to say, there is a door on you with no knob. Christ will knock. You can either open or not. That's beautiful. All right. So, Lily, are you tempted to, is it okay for you if this is not a poem of Christian symbolism? And if it is not, then what is it? It's okay for me, although I think that the word prayed makes it a little bit harder to ignore that reading. But I still think um, that we can take sun a little more literally, and especially if we think about um, sort of what Max was alluding to earlier about the blinding coming of morning and especially just that like, like blinding, you're not ready for it, but it's coming anyway aspect. That's cool. Emily, I'm gonna read you the stanza that begins, shall we not shudder, and ask you to say something about it. Shall we not shudder, this is after the sun has shown up and banged on the door. Shall we not shudder, shall we not flee into the shelter, the dear thick shelter, odd phrase, of the familiar propitious haze. Ooh, I made a rhyme there by my mention of odd phrase and then we get haze there's no there's no rhyme i just made it but um what haze is this and what's the shelter and what's going on well the reading that i tended towards was was ali's reading is it being it's sort of a vision of tell the truth but tell it slant and the slantedness might be the haze that sort of hazy ignorance what's that the opposite of haze clarity clarity so theoretically following steve's summoning of the blues tradition theoretically the long night, dark night of the soul, which is not just a blues tradition, but is in fact a, a Christian autobiography tradition, a Maul Flanders tradition, a Pilgrim's Progress tradition, where you go through the long night and then you emerge into the clarity and the sun. And the sun becomes Brooks's way of tapping into that literary history and that um, Christian iconographic history and allowing us to go into clarity. And the poem itself is remarkably clear. And yet, Suddenly, she asks the question, shall we not flee into this haze? Should, should we? Should we not do it? What does that mean for you? Should we or should we not? Yeah, what's she asking? If we're ready, in a sense, for the truth, perhaps, or for some sort of Christ-like figure, some sort of capital T truth. Where would she come down, Amaris, on the side of whether success in circuit lies? 
tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Is this a slanted truth, this Brooks poem? I mean, for me, at the end of it, it was difficult to see if she was advocating for this direct confrontation with truth. So I would say that she would agree with Dickinson that it should be circuited. Probably that's where the title um, comes into significance, the fact that it's not capitalized and that she begins with a question and that she does not begin with a condition, but rather a conjunction, to me was significant of sort of an attitude of openness, but at the end it's still dwelling in darkness, but yet a darkness that's going to go somewhere. Nice. Jason, snug unawareness. Sweet is it, sweet is it to sleep in the coolness, and that coolness summons the shelter. I, I, mm -hmm. I sense like it's just too hot out there in the clear sun, mm -hmm. and it's just so much better to sleep in. Yeah, well, I would say that in addition to the Christ imagery or the idea of, there's the idea of, of kind of salvation or some sort of end of the world. But I think that we want to swing around the Mediterranean to uh, maybe Athens and get a little bit of the allegory of the cave in there as well. Where this would be Plato. Yes, Plato's cave in which there are people who are seeing illusions and taking them for real. And when they go outside, that actually the truth of, of existence is so blinding that it is actually painful and that there's desire to you know, so not only, so truth and, and freedom suddenly granted becomes gratefully uh, a burden, the burden of, of freedom or the uh, shock of truth. Um, uh, might be harder to face than what one has become habituated to. So Lily, where does Brooks stand? Does she have a position here on whether we should accept the hard hammering of the sun and get up and face the light? That would be the con more conventional sentiment, and that may be the sentiment here. Um, or is she saying, you know, we sh should we not, shall we not, in fact, not go into that sun? I think that um, Amaris mentioned the starting of the poem with a conjunction, and I also noticed that, and I thought that um, the whole poem had a sense that it, the poem itself was weighing the options. Like, she might not have decided herself at the beginning what she felt um, our attitude should be, and in fact, maybe our attitude about this sort of coming of a new order or the coming of the sun or whatever should perhaps be that... Um, it won't be easy, and we can read it critically. We don't have to just accept it coming towards us. Good. So I'm going to invite everybody and anybody uh, two more rounds. Um, the first round I'm going to ask, I'm going to set it up a little by talking about Etheridge Knight's response. Not that we'll get into that, because there's a poem talk about that. But um, I, I want to sort of summon the idea that he had and see if that changes your view of the poem. And then I want to go around and ask everyone the, the question I posed to Anna at the beginning, and to Anna too, um, which is, you know, now that we've talked about it, what, what in sum would you say to a neophyte reader this poem is about? And if you want, when we go around for that, you can add a point about whether this poem connects to the lessons we've learned about modernism or about the slanted truth or any of that stuff. So make it a mod po poem or not. Okay, so, the, so uh, Etheridge Knight wrote a response to this poem in which he essentially argued that the sun did come. Not if it comes, but it did. And it was Malcolm X. And he came and we blew it. We didn't see that he was the guy, who, the sun, that needed to take us out into the bright sunshine. Now, Eth Etheridge Knight and Malcolm X shared the biographical fact of having been imprisoned for quite a while, uh, Malcolm X, for a different kind of misbehavior. Um, than uh, night. But uh, the point is that they shared this idea that it, that coming out from the night years was like coming out of prison and coming into the light for night of poetry. And for Malcolm X, into the light of what he perceived as a clear set of principles, just to put it neutrally. So night is essentially saying to Brooks, not if, but when, and when it came, we weren't ready. Why weren't we ready? 
and this is Knight t talking to in the this is Etheridge Knight in the Harlem Renaissance tradition, largely thought of responding to Brooks, who had sustained the tradition of the kind of poetry that Sterling Brown or Langston Hughes would write. So in this line, if we want to force that line to be a line, we have Knight rebuking his beloved elder, saying the sun came and we weren't ready. And in a way, kind of sort of accusing her of, though he was very polite to her, accusing her of being of the generation of people who would write about how maybe we shouldn't be ready. Maybe we should stay in the dark. So I just want your thought on that, not so much on the night. Now that's a K-N-I-G-H-T, not the night years. How it, this, so what's your thinking now about what this poem does? Is she urging us out into the light and does it have anything to do with poetry and poetics as we've understood it? What a difficult question. <laughs> but um, you can go anywhere you want as usual with it. I'll start with Max who seems ready. <coughs> Listeners to this audio don't know how ready Max looks. <laughs> <laughs> I look very ready, I'm okay. sure. Tell us quickly I, what, where we are now. I think it's it's um, she she does want us to, to come out into the light. I think I think she is she saying does. that uh, ultimately that that is um, what she is advocating. Uh, but at the same time, it, it is such a complicated poem, and the fact that the sun the sun is embodied, the sun is given is given a a, a gender. Uh, the sun has firm knuckles and there's this fierce hammering you get the sense that this truth this thing that um that we shouldn't just be turning away from this thing that we've longed for is still going to come and hunt us down there's something ominous and threatening about it good thank you Kristen. yeah i i definitely agree with what max is saying here i think that what brooks is talking about in this poem is that she does want us to open our eyes and get away from the dark, but she she's does. saying that it's really going to be hard and so it's not. It's going to be lines, painful. The dark hangs heavily over yeah. over the eyes. We're not really ready, but we should be. Yeah, she. I think she. I think it's a painful truth that right. people yeah. need to be awoke. Allie, your thought too. I'm sorry, Kristen. Finish your thought. I was just saying. I think it's a painful truth that is hard to wake up to, and that okay. it's easier to stay in. Okay, Allie. Um. Yeah, I agree. Um. And not to kind of criticize Etheridge Knight's. Um, kind of critique of the poem, but I think it's probably a lot easier to um, make that critique in, in retrospect when you're saying, oh, well, this happened and we missed it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's possible that Knight, I mean, we, I was involved in that poem talk discussion, and I don't know if it came up, I can't remember, but it's possible that Knight was reading this poem as about Christ and sort of extending the Christ's the tradition of Christ's return and the end of night to someone like Malcolm X, which is a kind of daring revolutionary thing to do. Anyway, you were you were saying Yeah, and I mean if you're going along that kind of religious line, then like, well, what do you do if you've missed it? Um are you gonna wait for a second Messiah or are you gonna wait for something? Are you gonna start the painful process of yeah. unshielding yes, nice. your eyes? Um, you know. Nice. Collectively, and and what is what is what is valuable, uh, Lily, about um, Brooks's approach the, to the extent that it's Dickinsonian? It's really not participating in um, a definite symbolization, symbolic history, or even a. It, it really is about daily waking in a way, in a Dickinsonian way. You know, we this is what we do every day when we. I'm kind of getting the chills saying this when we. Every night is the night years, and get it just, just, I'm thinking of, the reason I'm getting the chills is I'm thinking of Primo Levi, who wrote about his experience in the Holocaust, waking up every morning at Auschwitz, putting, he said, putting your feet on the floor and opening up the blisters one more time. It took an act of incredible courage to crawl out from the snugness and the coolness. Um, I'm, I'm making it sound more urgent than it is, but I do think it's urgent. I think she is saying... This is the hardest thing we do every day is to meet the sun. Lily. I do think that there's an urgency here. For me, the two lines that I'm, I've been thinking about are, though we have wept for him, though we have prayed. Um, I think there's, I think first of all, weeping and prying was convey a very emotional um, response, but also a sort of attempt to define emotion or um soothe ourselves and she's kind of saying she's saying though we wept and though we prayed 
though we did those things to prepare, we're still not going to be prepared. And and though we did those things to describe um, for ourselves what we thought we wanted or what we think we're getting, it might not fit those expectations. It might just blind those expectations away from us. Well put. Emily, your thought? Um, yeah, I think this poem is less interested in giving some sort of imperative to look at the light, whatever that may be, as to an imperative to look at ourselves, that even if the sublime, and whatever whatever type of sublime, sort of Christ-like, just sort of more general and nebulous than that, um, it doesn't matter if it's accessible if we don't know how to apprehend it. Mm, nicely said. I'm Maurice. So I agree with Lily and Emily, and I was thinking that she's saying this is sort of showing how society needs a coaxing into consciousness that even when truth arrives, it's usually encountered with some sort of measure of resistance. And because there is this ominous quality that Max was talking about, the poem is very calming and soothing the way that Lily was saying. And even if we dismiss the religious undertones and allusions that we could possibly make, it still has this sort of hymnal quality with the repetition in the anaphora um, of like thou, uh, though and shall and of the um, sweet as it, sweet as it. So I think it is encouraging, but in a very sort of gentle, coaxing sense. Mm. Classic Brooks. Dave? The line that means the most to me is, shall we not flee into the shelter? Because that creates a feeling of running away from the truth. Because to me, it sounds like she's advocating, you have to look at the truth, but it's just so comfortable to live in this self-deception that we have. And the way she even describes the propitious haze, the snug unawareness, it's really comfortable. You want to stay in that in that self-deception, um, but really, you really shouldn't. Cool. Steve? Um, I think the most terrifying, and uh, well, yeah, I think the most terrifying thing about this is that there will be more truths to come, right? You get to the end, sweet it is, sweet it is, uh, to sleep in the coolness of snug, oops, that's not the line I'm looking for, the dark hangs heavily over the eyes. When the scales fall from your eyes, there are more scales behind them. And um, so this may be, uh, you know, she's dwelling in anxiety here, and I don't think that she is necessarily pushing the reader into the light, and that's really what makes it uh, such a striking and singular and, and good poem. Nice, you're all hot here. Jason? Yeah, and I think that uh, what's beautiful about the poem that maybe is uh, that the response to it as as an ina- inadequately revolutionary uh, call to arms is the tone in which it asks these questions instead of saying we shall not shudder, we shall not flee. The qu- I mean. Th- the answer to the question seems to be an implicit, of course we shall shudder, and of, of course we shall flee. And almost um, the poem working like a, an inoculation to acknowledge in advance and, and kind of comfort the fear that will inevitably come when the chance to um, act or face truth or light comes it's it's almost 